You gotta know I'm feeling loved, made it go. I never loved another one, another you. It's gotta be love. I said it. You gotta know I'm feeling love. You gotta know. The best day of the week is Thursday, and you write this down real quick. The best day of the week is Thursday, because Thursday night is family night. <laughs> Thursday night is family night. Man, we're a big family. Whether you're here for the first time or the hundredth time, we're so stoked that you guys came to kick it with us on the best night, the best day of the entire week. If you're in a summer group, can you make some noise real quick? <laughs> yeah. This last week was wild, wasn't it? <laughs> and if you weren't there, then you missed out. If you missed out, you missed out. Will France win the World Cup? Who knows? Will Wakanda? Who knows? Will Brazil? Only God knows. But hey, we want to just invite you guys. We've only got two weeks left of summer groups, which is a boo. But right around the corner, we have fall groups starting. So don't fret. It's going to be great. Yes. Hey, is anybody stoked on the luau after Spectrum tonight? Yeah. You guys look fantastic. Cannot wait to be out there with you. Got some shaved ice on the way. It's going to be going to be great. Also, Isotopes this Saturday. Man, we just got a whole bunch of sweet stuff going on, don't we? If you haven't heard about Isotopes, man, we're going to talk about it in just a little bit. But we want to invite you guys out to that on Saturday night. Who was here last week for Summer Love? Great, great. Well, if you were here last week, uh, we talked about pursuing purity and all about pretty much how purity isn't just your virginity. Purity is your heart and your life before God. And as we continue on in summer love tonight, we're going to learn all about love, all about what love is, all about how we're supposed to love, all about how Jesus loves. And so before we continue, let's, uh, let's commit tonight to the Lord. Father, we come before you. And uh, we just thank you for this time. Thank you that we can be free here, God. Thank you that we can taste life to the full. Thank you that you're present here with us. I pray that anyone who doesn't know you or doesn't know your love, God, would know it by the end of tonight, Father. We pray that you'd move, you'd speak. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Love is something that everyone desires. Can you agree with that? Everyone desires love. You're like, I, I just want to be loved, right? Like my cat will love me, so it feels kind of good, but we all want to be desired by love. We all desire love. You, love is a universal thing that humanity so desperately craves, but it's something that some people really know nothing about. I want to teach you tonight about real love, not about that love you see in the movies or hear legends about, but about real, unending, pure love. Tonight we're going to look at three things about real love and how we can experience it. And I mean really experience and give others real love. I've titled this message Summer Love. And you guys can go ahead and open your Bibles to 1 John chapter 4. If you've got a Bible, check it out. If you don't, just go on Google, type that bad boy in, and uh, we'll be good. But we'll get there in just a minute. The first thing that we'll learn tonight is, number one, what is love? What is love? Every year, we celebrate Valentine's Day, and uh, it's a day that we've deemed to be all about this crazy thing called love. On average, Americans will spend around $140 on Valentine's Day alone on their loved one. The average American spends $140 on their loved one. And you're over here on Valentine's Day, right, when it rolls around, you're like, oh, dear God, 140 bill, bro? Like, I'm over here using uneaten Halloween candy, you know, saving like those Tootsie Rolls and like the off-brand candy because let's be real, we don't mess with off-brand candy, y'all. We do not mess with off-brand candy. And let's be honest, we don't mess with that because we only want the best, right, the name brand stuff. I will be honest though, a little disclaimer, off-brand cereal is lit, dude. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? 
off-brand cereal. Some of you will be in college soon. Ramen and off-brand cereal. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So when Valentine's Day rolls around, right, you're saving your leftover Halloween candy. Like, I don't got $140, but I'm going to scavenge my little sister's Valentine's Day cards. And so, uh, you know, nothing says be mine like a little horse on a piece of cardboard. Nothing says be mine like off-brand candy and my little pony Valentine's, right? Nothing says I love you more than off-brand candy and my little pony Valentine's Day cards. You give it to that loved one, they're like, I, I don't like this. You're like, what? I, you don't like it? Of course I love you. You say, honestly, you had me at, hey. Sorry, guys, I'm just horsing around. My bad, my bad. Every year, Americans spend around $13.2 billion on this day of love. On Valentine's Day alone, $2.2 billion is spent on jewelry. $403 million is spent on flowers. $180 million Valentine's Day cards are exchanged. And hundreds of thousands of pounds of chocolate are eaten. But who will admit that they really only care about the chocolate, right? Who will admit that they only really care about the chocolate? Some people want to be shown love so badly. Some people want to be shown that they are loved so badly and experience that that 14% of women will send themselves flowers. It's really sad, actually. Men, men, let's change that statistic, cool? Great. Call to arms. 53% of women, though, say that they would end their relationship if they didn't get a gift on Valentine's Day. 53%! Ladies, you know, y'all need to change that statistic, right? That's crazy. We'll do it first. Okay. So, guys, get girls flowers. Girls, don't be mad if you don't get flowers. It's a weird thing. What? The mind of a woman. That's another sermon. That's another sermon. (laughs) Everyone wants to be happy. Everyone wants to be loved. But does this day really celebrate and offer real love? We live in a culture that takes more than it gives. And our society's views on love are so blurred and confused. Did you know that about 5.6 billion people in the world today don't know real love? 5.6 billion, you say? Yeah. They love people. They love their cats. They have families and partners and loved ones, and they spend hundreds of thousands of dollars trying to show their love, don't they, you may argue. And while you may be accurate in saying that people experience love, I want to challenge that thought and say, is that real love that they are experiencing? I want to ask you, are you experiencing real love right now? And real quick, whoever is sending stuff over airdrop, please stop. It's very distracting. Thank you. So are you experiencing real love? What we need to know is that someone, friend, will only experience and know real love once they've met real love. Someone will only experience real love once they've met real love. When you say met real love, yes, met real love. And friend, you can't buy this love. You can't put a price tag on this love. So let's answer the question, well, what is love? Who is this love? Love, real love is this. 1 John 4, 7 through 12, you can follow along if you've got it. It says, dear friends, let us love one another for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love God does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed us his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. Friend, God is love. And unless we know God, the reality is is that we will not know love, and we won't love how we're supposed to love. Supposed to love, you may say. Yeah, supposed to love. Do you know that there's a way that we're supposed to love? And you may say, Cody, don't I just... Do what feels right. Don't I just follow my heart? Well, you could, but it won't work out as well 
as you might think. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Friend, unless you're the heart whisperer, which some of you young boys might claim to be, unless you're the heart whisperer, no one can understand a person's motives or intentions. Our hearts are deceitful. So you say, yeah, I'm just going to listen to my heart. Bruh, your heart is wicked. (laughs) Your heart is wicked, my friend. Do not follow that bad boy. Because your heart always follows feelings, and love is not a feeling. Friend, love is a choice. Love is a verb. Love is an action. Love is a fundamental characteristic of who God is. See, everything God does is influenced by his love. And the Bible uses several different words in the Hebrew and Greek languages and interchanges them depending on the context of Scripture. And so we're going to dig at that for just a second. But it's important to know that some of these words in the Bible, obviously we read it in English unless you're a boss and you can read Greek and Hebrew. But when we see the word love, it's always important for us to dig into the original language because there we understand what God is saying. See, in the Greek, in the, in the Hebrew, is, uh, is big, mostly, sorry, mostly the original language. You know, Jesus spoke Aramaic. But it's important that as we read the Bible, always dig, my friend. You know, you hear about the Greek, and you're like, who cares about the Greek? Well, if you check out the Greek, then you'll know the real meaning. <laughs> so we're going to do that. So some of these words, when you say, like, when you see God so loved the world or that you must love one another, it's important to look at that word love because there are different meanings for that word love. Some of these words mean affectionate love. Other words talk about friendship. Other other love words mean romantic, sexual love. The Bible gives many examples of love, and maybe you know some of these, such as, the caring help and love that Boaz gave to Ruth, King David's great-grandma, such as the deep brotherly love and friendship of, of, friendship of King David and his brother-in-law, Jonathan. It's like the passionate romantic love of King Solomon and his wife, the committed and enduring love of the prophet Hosea and his prostitute wife, Gomer. Remember we talked about them. The fatherly love that the apostle Paul had for Timothy and John and the church. And most importantly, the sacrificial, unconditional, unending, selfless love of Jesus Christ. So all of those love words, they mean different things. And what I want to talk to you guys tonight is a specific type of love. It's a unique Greek word that God displays. And this word, friend, is so crucial to understand as we seek to not only experience this type of love, but show this love to those we date to marry, those we serve with, those family members, those friends, those people that aren't the easiest to love, the strangers that we meet. And the Greek word for this type of love, and maybe you've heard it before, it's called agape. Agape. Agape love is a sacrificial, unconditional, selfless love that seeks the best for others above all else. See, the Bible says that since real love is part of God's nature, then God is the source of love. 1 John 4.10 says that this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a forgiving sacrifice for our sins. Well, you got to know, Spectrum, friend, family, legend, homie, whatever, is that we did nothing to deserve his love, but he gave it anyway. That we did nothing to deserve his love, but he gave it anyway. He chose to love us despite how bad we are, despite the fact that some of us may never even love him back. See, this is love, not the love that we see in society, a love that's shallow, that can be purchased, that can be thrown away so cheaply due to hurt feelings or tragedy. Real love is God's love. Real love is God's love. And as we look at love through our broken humanity, through our broken sinful humanity, our understanding of love is weak. It's flawed. It's incomplete and confused. But the more we look at Jesus, the better understanding we have of love. The more we look at Jesus, the better we understand love. Real love is God's love. Love comes from God because God is love. And I love 1 Corinthians 13 because it shows us so clearly What love is, check this out. It says, love is patient. Love is kind. Does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. 
It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. So what is love? Friend, this is love. Patience, kindness, humility, sacrifice, honor, selflessness, self-control, forgiveness, truth, protection, hope, forever. This is love. Are we experiencing this love? Are you here tonight and you're like, man, that sounds really sick. I wish I could have some. Break me off a piece of that Kit Kat bar, brother, right? It's like, I want that. Are we experiencing this kind of love, this real, true love? Are we not only experiencing it, but remember, love is a verb, friend. It's an action. Ask yourself, if I know this, am I living this out? If I'm a Christian, if I know this type of love, am I living this out? Love is a choice. That requires an action. And friend, if we truly love people, then we will show them our love no matter the cost. So what is love? God is love. The second thing we'll learn is this. You can write this down. Number two, how we love. How we love. Jesus says in John 14, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My father will love them and we will come to them to make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. If we love Jesus, then we will obey Jesus. If we love Jesus, then we will obey Jesus. The reality is is that obedience isn't an easy thing. (laughs) It requires humility. It requires submission. And if you're like me, it has been something that doesn't come naturally. Anybody in the same boat? Anybody in the same boat, right? Obedience does not come naturally. And I seem to have passed that quality trait down to my daughter. Quality trait. Feels good. Yes, the best, right? So Berkeley seems to have gotten over her diapy off stage, right? Remember that? I think she's done with that, so praise God. But lately, she's been throwing things. And not just, like, things, but, like, heavy things. Like the iPad. (laughs) Or, like, her bottle or her sippy cup full of milk. And she throws stuff because she doesn't want to hurt you. She just thinks it's funny. She just, like, thinks, she, like, throws it. She goes, ha, 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 ha. And I'm like, oh, my, my leg, right? It's like, dear Lord. She's kind of like the Sour Patch commercials, though, right? Like, first they're sour, then they're sweet. So she'll throw, like, even this morning, I'm saying goodbye. I'm like, Bert, come here, you know? And she runs up to me, and her hair's all, like, bobbing, you know? And she's, so I'm like, bye. And she has her sippy cup, and I pick her up, right? And she just goes, boop. And I'm like, oh! And I look, my eyes, like, bleeding. Not really, but it hurt. But right after, she says, love you, and gives me a kiss. I'm like, <laughs> the mind of a woman. She'll chuck something, bruise my eyeballs, and then say, sorry, sorry, sorry. And then give me a kiss. And I don't really know how to feel about it, right? I'm torn because she's so cute, but it hurts, like, so bad on the reel. I'm like, oh, you know, or, like, it's late, and I'll step on, like, a Lego. And if you've ever seen, like, oh, you know, you just go down. It's Once you've hit, like, a Lego, you just, just go with it. Don't even try and, like, recover. Just, just lay over and die. Like, it's, you're done. <laughs> You're done. First, she's sour. Then she's sweet. But it's funny because no matter how many times I say, Berkeley, don't, don't throw. Or I'll get, Berkeley, don't throw. And she'll just kind of look at me and go, ha <laughs> No matter how many times I say, Berkeley, please, just please, don't throw. She just, you know what she does? She throws. She does it. She is her father's daughter, though. Proud dad right here. Feels great. Seem to pass that down to her. Gosh, pray for us. (laughs) Good job. Thank you. I totally had to say, and I'm like, God, give her disobedience. Give her this and that. Wouldn't that be crazy if you could pick, like, how you wanted your kids to be? That'd be pretty cool. Maybe that's something in, like, 2050. Who knows? Who knows? But obedience is something that we all struggle with. Amen? Amen. Yeah? 
Obedience is something that we all struggle with. And if you don't struggle with it, then you are the perfect human being. Great job. You have 300 crowns waiting for you in heaven. (laughs) Obedience is something that we all struggle with. To truly obey, we must surrender everything. And that's especially hard when we live in a world that's constantly telling us what feels right and what we should do is follow that feeling and to follow our hearts and to do what makes us happy. But friend, haven't you noticed that following your heart has more often than not led you to a place you didn't think you'd be? That following what feels right is often taking you to a place that you never desired to be. And if you've wondered that, if you've experienced that, it's because our hearts are wicked, friend. And the love that we give apart from Jesus, it's a tainted love. It's a love that should look a certain way but isn't a certain way because of our wickedness. Aren't you tired of being empty? Like, aren't you tired of just being empty? Aren't you tired of, like, living in society where you can't even look at Instagram because you're going to see something inappropriate or see some kind of drug or pill or hear something? Aren't you tired of being empty? Aren't you tired of living in this society that's sick and dying? Aren't you tired of being in charge of your own life? It's tiring, isn't it? Trying to be the CEO of Cody headquarters. Ah. It sucks. It's hard. It's tiring. But see, friend, when we surrender, when we lay down our lives, we will see that surrender is the first step to obedience. That surrender is the first step to obedience. Friend, you've got to trust that God has everything under control. And I hope that you've learned throughout this series that that God has a plan and purpose for all things, for your heartbreak for your pain, right, for your singleness, for your dating, for your purity. He has a plan for for your love life. He has a plan for your life in general. He has a, a plan for you to experience the trueness of who he is. And if God is love, then you've got to trust that God wants you to experience love and not fake love, but real love. Surrender is the first step to obedience. If God is holding life, in the palm of his hands, then what can't he do? If God could speak and planets fly out, what can't he do? If God could say, hey, see, why don't you split in half and let my people walk through on dry land, then what can't he do, friends? Do you see where I'm going with this? What, God, what can, can God not do? He's God. He's in control of all things. So if you trust him, If you surrender your life, if you love him, then you're going to obey him because his ways are best and our ways are not. If we love Jesus, we must obey Jesus. If we love him, we will follow him, friend, no matter the cost. Once we know what love is, we will know how we're supposed to love. Once we know what love is, we'll know how we're supposed to love. And so we're going to talk about that. How, How do I love, Cody, you may ask? Well, friend, in the context of dating, a lot of times we're going to want to show someone you love them by this physical act, right? Like by this physical act. And you're going to want to do things with them. You're going to want to pressure them because you're like, hey, that's, that's love, right? It's getting physical. And in this society that we live in, man, everyone is so geared towards being physical before marriage, to giving their se- themselves away. Why? Because I think the, the reality is, is that so many people are afraid of missing out on love. And so they're looking for love in all the wrong places. And if you're like me, man, I, I'm a pro at that. <laughs> but see, the way that we show people love is by obeying God. The way that we show people love is by obeying God. You need to be careful that summer love doesn't turn into summer lust. That summer love doesn't turn into summer lust. Did you know that the average age among young boys and girls to lose their virginity is 17 years old? 17 years old. 
And the most common time that this happens is in the summer. Be careful that summer love doesn't turn into summer lust. Maybe you're bombarded with that pressure that if you're not getting physical, then you're missing out on love. That if you're not giving yourself away, then man, you won't experience real love. But friend, there is a love that won't take from you. There is a love that won't take advantage of you, but will give you everything. Real love is respecting him. Real love is respecting her. Real love is patience, honor, humility, not pressure and sex and drugs and alcohol and all the stuff that comes with this world. Real love is respecting him or respecting her. Real love is not taking advantage of someone or forcing them to do something. That's not love. That's lust. That's not love. That's lust. God says before marriage, loving that person means honoring them and respecting their bodies. Did you know that? That before marriage, God says, hey, you want to love them? Cool. Well, respect them, honor them, respect their bodies, obey me, trust me, seek me first. Because if you don't, friend, then you're going to end up in that bitter cycle of sin. Spin cycle sin, remember? Remember? thrown around in the cycle again and again and you stop and it's again and again and it takes and you give and it takes and you give and then rock bottom. Friend, you need to follow the boundaries that God has set in motion because he wants you to experience real love, not fake love. You need to follow those boundaries because as we talked about even last week, God's not setting these rules to restrict you. He's giving you guidelines to help you. He's giving you guidelines to help you. He knows what's best. And see, the way that we love others is by loving God first and keeping his commands first. We honor God. We deny ourselves. We preach truth. We forgive others. We pray for our enemies. We love like Jesus loves. The Bible says so clearly that we are to love others the way that God loves us. 1 Peter 2.17 says, respect everyone and love your Christian brothers and sisters. Fear God and respect the king. This may be a hard thing to do, but friend, we're to love our enemies. Do you know that? We're to love our enemies. That is, we are to actively seek what is best for them. What? What's best for our enemies, man? What's best is for me to stay away from them, right? Like, how am I supposed to love them? How am I supposed to actively seek out? Why would I actively seek out what's best for those who hate me? Why? Jesus says in Matthew 5, 44, this is why, because Jesus says to. He says, I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Friend, actively seek them. Go to them and say, hey, like, I know you hate me. Don't say that. Say, hey, I'm praying for you. Is there anything I can pray for? Hey, can I get you lunch? Like, how can I love this person who hates me? See, love is an action. We must actively seek them out. And friends, if if you're called one day to be a husband or wife, husbands, you're to love your wives as Christ loves the church. And wives, you're to submit to your husbands as the church submits to Jesus. 1 John 4.19 says we love because he first loved us. Loved us. Friend, don't you see that all of these examples, all of these biblical truths are based on us obeying God. That if he says it, all right, I'm going to do it. I'm going to trust you, God, even though it's going to be hard. I'm going to love this person the way that you love me. Because that is real love. And that's what you desire is for the world to know real love. And man, if if I can be a part of showing a dying world real love, I'll do whatever it takes. And I hope that you're in the same boat as well. Sold out for Christ, man. God, I'm all in. There's nothing else for me. I want to go and show the world true love through my life, through my words, through my actions. Because I've tasted death, death long enough. And I don't want anything to do with it. We love because he first loved us. Friend, as we show sacrificial, selfless love, we are showing God's love to a lost and dying world. And I hope you see that we serve God, and I hope that you desire to serve God, not for the benefit, but simply because you love him. God, if you saved me, like, I want to serve you. 
you gave your life for me, so I'm going to give my life for you. You need to know that God's love for us gives us the freedom to obey him without the fear of guilt or punishment. Do you know that? That God's love for us gives us that freedom without fear or guilt of punishment. 1 John 4.18 says that perfect love, perfect agape is the word there. Perfect love, perfect agape drives out fear. And Romans 8.1 says that there is no condemnation in Christ. So since we know that God is perfect love and since we know that perfect love casts out fear, we must know that there's no fear in the presence of God. There's no fear in the presence of God. Friend, you don't have to serve God fearing that you're not going to go to to the right person, that you're not going to say the right thing, that you're not going to end up with the right person. There is no fear in serving God. And some of you need to know that. There's no fear in serving God. We are free to be who he made us to be. And when we are truly following God, friend, you've got to know that the Holy Spirit If you're in Christ, he lives in you. He's your compass. He's your roadmap, your guide. That's a promise that he's going to direct you to the people who are stuck in sin. I want to ask you some questions, and then we're going to move on, and I'm going to invite the band up. They can come up now. I want to just ask you guys some questions. As we've just heard, like, all of this stuff, all of this biblical truth, like, how we love, I want to ask you questions. Put the ball in your court because this is great to hear, isn't it? We can sit on this all day. That sounds great, Cody. Hallelujah. Amen. Write that down. But if you don't go back and actually apply what God is telling you, then let me ask you, do you really love him? Because if you loved him, you would obey him. If you love him, you would obey him, my friend. What if you're the only one who can get through to that person? What if you're the only one that they'll ever trust? What if you're the only one that has ever told them that you love them? Friend, what if they're the only opportunity? What if you're the only person that's going to go? Like, don't, you, don't you see the opportunity that God has before you? What if that person that God's calling you to love, to be obedient, to go out, is headed to hell but could be headed to heaven because you went to them? What if? Do not underestimate your calling. On your life. Do not underestimate the power of prayer. Do not take for granted the opportunity you have been called to take. Do not forget that you might be the closest thing to Jesus that these people may ever see on this side of life. Seize the opportunity so that when people see Jesus after they die, he's their savior, not their judge. Take the opportunity. See, before you were saved, there was judgment because you were guilty of sin. But now, once you're saved by Jesus, friend, there's no condemnation. There is no guilt. There is no shame. There is no judgment. Once you've accepted Jesus, you're free. You're forgiven. Because once we know the real love of God, we know that God's judgment fell on Jesus at the cross so that we could be spared and given life. Don't you see that we need to go and share this so that when people see Jesus after they die, he's their savior, not their judge. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that whoever believes would not perish, right, would not go to hell but would be given eternal life, would go to heaven. We all know that verse. But so many of us forget to read the next verse. It says, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Friend, this is how we must love. Not by fake love but real love. We know what love is. We know how we must love. And lastly, we can see, you can write this down, number three, how he loves. How he loves. There's this story in the book of Luke that I want to share with you, and it's a story of, of two sons. One of the sons goes to his dad and says, hey, dad, I, I want my inheritance. I want what's been promised to me now. And so the father gives him the money that he would inherit one day. He gives it to him early. And this son goes off, and he spends all his money on prostitutes and alcohol and experiences and lives it up and throws every ounce of money that his father gave him into the wrong things. And 
Soon a a really bad famine hits the land. And so this son who didn't have any money decides to start working for a person who would feed pigs the slop, the sludge. And the story goes in the Bible, it says that this son became so hungry because he had no money and there was a famine that he was so tempted to eat the pig's food, but no one would give him any. So he comes to his senses, he says, man, like in my father's house, he has servants that are eating three meals a day. Like I've messed up. I'm going to go back to him and ask for forgiveness. And I've just, I've been sleeping around and living it up. And, and I'm sorry, I need, I need to go back to my father. And so he's thinking, he's walking back, and he says, you know what, like, I just feel like, I just feel like my father could never take me back. I just feel like he'll never forgive me. And some of you feel that as well. You say, man, I know I'm I'm messing up. I know I'm in this terrible spot, and I've spent everything and given myself away, and I'm broken, but uh, God's never going to take me back. But the story goes on like this. The Bible says that the father sees his son off in the distance. It says that the father opens his arms wide. And he starts running to his lost son. The son that had left, that had gone away, who had given himself to things. And the father sees him and he runs to him. And you can just see it. Just see it. Tears streaming down his face. Seeing his boy that he, he created, that he raised, that he taught, that he loved. Coming back home. And you can just see the son seeing his father in the distance. And just thinking, man, like he's going to be so mad at me. He's going to be so ashamed of me. And then he sees his father running with a smile on his face and his arms open wide. And he, he starts to realize that, that my, my father doesn't care about what I've done. That my father doesn't care about what I've done. He doesn't care how far I've fallen, he says. Where I've gone, he realizes that his father, friend, just wants him back. And the father gets to the son and he says, my son who was once lost has now been found, who was once dead, but now is alive. I'm reminded of another son who left his father's house, but not to spend his riches or live it up, but who gave up his riches and who gave up his life so that other sons and daughters could return to their heavenly father. And this one His arms are permanently open, friend. An act of love, an act of choice. You see, his arms are open because they've been nailed to a tree. They're open wide for his lost sons and daughters to come back home. His love for you, friend, is so great. It's so unconditional that he chose to leave heaven. He chose to put on flesh. He chose to be betrayed. He chose to be spit upon and beaten until he was unrecognizable. He chose to take off his crown of glory and put on a crown of shame. He chose to be spit upon and mocked and hung up on that tree. He chose to be cut and bloody and become sin. Why? So that he could show you that he loves you this much. So he can show you that he loves you this much. So that you could come back home. So that you could be with the Father. And we say, Father, like, I've sinned against you. I've sinned before you. I don't deserve to be called your son, your daughter ever again. But the Father replies, don't you see? You were dead. (laughs) But now you're alive. You, You were dead, but now... You were alive, you were lost, but now you're found. Friend, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father except through him. And as Jesus chose to stretch out his arms open wide on that cross, so he opened the gates of heaven so that whoever believes shall be forgiven and able to be with God in heaven. See, when we accept Jesus, God doesn't care about what we've done. He doesn't care about how far we've fallen. All he cares about is that we've accepted his son with those arms open wide upon that cross. And when Jesus sees us, he sees us 
It's beautiful. When God sees us, friend, he sees us through what his son Jesus did for us upon that cross. Our worst in exchange for his best. Isaiah 61.3 says, To give them a crown of beauty for ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. Don't you see how much he loves you? That he didn't just say it, friend. He showed it. He didn't just say it. He showed it. He chose this. Don't you see? He chose this so you don't only receive the full power of the cross, but you receive the full power of the resurrection, friend. You were once dead, but now you're alive. You were once dead, but now you're alive. See, when Jesus died, when Jesus died, he took sin down with him. But when he rose from the dead, he brought God down to us. Don't you see, when Jesus died, he took sin down to the grave with him. But when he rose again, friend, he brought God down to us. How beautiful. How amazing. God, you need, you need to know, my friends, that time after time, Jesus shows us his love. The prodigal son, the thief on the cross, the woman at the well, the demon-possessed man, Zacchaeus, the tax collector, friend of sinners, friend, encounter after encounter, the woman at the well, the woman caught in adultery. He went, he met, he loved, he gave, he sacrificed, he died. And he rose from the dead. Don't you see that there are no boundaries on the love of God? That there are no boundaries on the love of God. The next time you say, I'm not good enough. The reality is, is you're not. But he says you're worth everything. He says you're worth everything. Friend, this is love. Love is a choice, and he chose you. You are his first choice now, always, forever. You're his first choice, friend. As we close, we need to know that Jesus didn't feel like dying on a cross. Jesus didn't feel like dying on a cross, but he was obedient to the Father. If you love me, you will obey me. God says. Friend, this is how Jesus loves us. This is the way Jesus wants us to love others, to love him. Can we love others like this? Can we be actively praying for them? Can we be actively forgiving? Can we be sacrificing, sharing truth with them, helping them, seeking them, giving up everything for them? See, we can't give this love if we don't accept his love. We can't give this love unless we accept his love. So what love have you been giving? Worldly, selfish love or heavenly, selfless love?